Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. The NCC WSC Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. I'd like to welcome Sean Carter, Senior Scientist um, at the NCC WSC to introduce our speaker. Sean? Thanks, Ashley. Uh, today I'm happy to uh, have Dr. Phil Moult present uh, on some of the work that he's been doing with our Northwest uh, Climate Science Center. Phil is a professor of college at, of, in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. He's also the director for OCRI, the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute. And he also is director for the Oregon Climate, of Oregon Climate Services, which is um, the state climate office for Oregon. Phil's current research interests include scenario development, regional climate change, regional climate modeling, and adaptation to climate change. And Phil is also part of the leadership team at the Northwest Climate Science Center and has been involved with the IPCC, National Climate Assessment, and also the National Research Council. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Phil. Thank you, Sean and Ashley for, um, and Holly for setting this up. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. I look forward to your questions at the end. Um, I, on the first slide here, you see the, the cast of, uh, of folks involved in this work. Um, my colleague David Roop here at Oregon State University, John Abbasaglu and Catherine Higawish from University of Idaho, uh, Dennis Lettenmeyer, who leads the hydrology group at University of Washington, um, along with uh, Julie Vano, Homero Flores, and Matt Spimbaugh. Um, and Dominique Bachelet and John Kim, who've done the vegetation modeling, and I, I should also add Dave Turner from Oregon State University. Um, this is the culmination of a, a project funded by the Northwest Climate Science Center um, with support also from the NOAA regional entity here, the Climate Impacts Research Consortium. And John Abbasaglu and I also um, had some funding from the uh, USDA funded project, Regional Approaches to Climate Change in Pacific Northwest Agriculture. I particularly want to thank Goose Beesball, um, the director of the Northwest Climate Science Center for um, supporting this vision of, of providing these scenarios to um, the Northwest region, uh, which also led to a lot of conversations with CSCs around the country. Um, so uh, this project is wrapping up, but uh, we don't have all the results in yet. Um, and so what you'll see are, uh, in some cases, preliminary results. Um, we have a workshop coming up in Portland, Oregon, uh, two weeks from today that we'll spend a whole day on, uh, on this topic. Um, and uh, then we'll have a, a final report due to the Northwest CSC three months um, after the completion of the project. The motivation for this work was the recognition that natural resource managers were um, paying attention to climate change science, but at a bit, a bit of at a loss for how to apply it. You know, if, if someone told them your um, your habitat conservation plan or or the species management plan um, is no good because you haven't considered climate change, uh, you, even if they um, fully bought the science of climate change, they wouldn't really know where to turn or how to apply that to such a, an activity. And, and this is the space that climate science centers uh, intend to occupy, providing such guidance. And so it was natural that the CSC would, would play a lead role in this. Um, so what we were hearing was a need for uh, a, a complete and scientific description of what the future would look like in the Northwest region. Water availability, um, soil moisture and stream flow, snow cover, flood risk, uh, how will the drivers of climate uh, uh, impact change, the temperature and precipitation, and then all, also how will vegetation change. So the objectives of this project are to use the best available science to describe the future climate hydrology and vegetation. Now, there are um, fully coupled regional models that have vegetation and hydrology 
But with just a single model, as we've learned, and as you'll see, um, a single model is only able to produce a modest spread of results that, that may not accurately represent the, the true range of possibilities just because of how models are, are constructed and choices that are made. So we wanted to be able to um, characterize the uncertainties uh, of the system, and that meant using a different approach than just one single wonderful model. We want to use um, a range of climate inputs and at least two impact models. So we have um, two hydrology models, uh, one of which is, is nearly done with, with a set of um, stimulations from uh, 20 climate model scenarios, and the second one that, that will follow shortly. And then we also have two uh, vegetation models in play. Um, so we're, we're fortunate to have a new generation of global climate models that, that were just released in the last few years. And so what we've done is uh, coordinate the climate model outputs uh, with the in, uh, inputs to both the hydrologic and vegetation modeling. And, and we have a spectrum of audiences um, ranging from, I just want a simple qualitative description, maybe a number here and there, uh, to researchers who want the full digital data at the, the resolution of, of the model outputs for some additional scientific analysis or modeling. The climate scenarios that we're using as inputs come from the coupled model intercomparison project, phase five, CMIP five. Um, this is a coordinated global modeling uh, effort that it uses 41 models that have been contributed to date for the 20th century um, and about 25 or 30 uh, that have done simulations for the 21st century. Uh, these started to be available in the year 2011 and they're still um, being uploaded to, um, to various archives. We wanted to evaluate these models on the regional scale and we've done that, this now both for the Northwest and to a lesser extent the Southwest. Um, but also for the southeast, and then recommend some models that, that are, are top tier. There are enough models that we can get a pretty good spread of results just using the ones that performed well in the 20th century. Now, I would note that there's, there's a supposition here that the um, performance of a model in the 20th century is a, an indication of how well it will do in the 21st century. Uh, we don't know whether that's true, but um, it, it seems reasonable, and so we, we use model performance uh, to, to shape our choices for models in the future. Then um, John Abbasi Blue at University of Idaho, who had developed this uh, MACA multivariate adaptive constructed analog uh, approach to downscaling, um, has downscaled uh, 20 GCMs for the whole continental US. Uh, we were initially uh, intending just to do the Northwest, but um, it turned out not to be that much work to do the whole continental US. And then we also have a comparison, which I won't talk with, uh, uh, talk much about, a comparison with the previous generation of global models, CMIP-3, which was uh, released around the year 2005. The drivers for these global models uh, are what are called representative concentration pathways, or RCPs, and you'll see this in a number of slides, so it's worth taking a few minutes to explain. Um, folks who do socioeconomic modeling uh, have postulated a wide variety of futures for the world depending on both uh, market and non-market forces, on policy choices, um, on availability of uh, fossil fuels and a wide range of other uh, considerations, uh, and also global population. Um, I draw your attention to uh, the orange curve, the RCP 8.5. Um, this is a world in which um, development is uh, fairly unfettered, in which coal is widely available and remains cheap, and so the developing countries are able to uh, rapidly follow uh, the developed world into a, a much more prosperous and consumptive future. Um, RCP6 is a more modest uh, version of that, uh, in which the uh, carbon dioxide amounts by the end of the century uh, don't quite reach 700 versus over 900 for RCP 8.5. RCP 4.5 is uh, more of a sort of gentle, sustainable future where uh, carbon dioxide amounts level off um, by around 2070 at 540 parts per million. Um, climate continues to change a little bit after that, but um, it, it's a, a, a rather different future. And then finally, RCP3PD, which is also known as RCP2.6, uh, um, 
is intended to reflect the success, uh, postulated success of policies which would reduce greenhouse gas emissions so substantially as to uh, limit the global temperature change to two degrees Celsius, which is a stated goal of um, many governments. Um, it's also sort of a Pollyanna um, uh, view of the world. Uh, dialing back emissions so dramatically um, would, would be uh, politically and economically a, a very heavy lift. So for this work, we're going to focus, focus on the sort of gentle sustainable world, RCP 4.5, the green curve, and RCP 8.5. Um, those uh, are shown here in comparison with the earlier generation, the CMIP 3 model uh, input, and um, those are the dashed curves. And note that the RCPs also extend beyond the year 2100. That's an important distinction. So you see there the RCP 2.6, which uh, initially is fairly similar to the others to about 2025 and, uh, and then departs rather dramatically. The y-axis here is radiative forcing. So this is essentially how much extra energy is added in watts to each square meter over the, over the Earth. So um, the, the year, um, um, the, the amounts are uh, initially uh, just a little over one watt per square meter and they rise to anywhere from 2.6 by the year 2100 uh, all the way up to 8.5 and that's, that's what the numbers for the RCPs correspond to. Um, these are the 20 models that we're using in this study um, listed by, in alphabetical order by country. Um, and you can see there are a number of entries from several different countries. This is, again, a subset of the total ones available. And the next several slides will show um, the climate variables for the Northwest, um, including a spread across the models uh, to show the uncertainty. And uh, they're smoothed for easier reading. Uh, later, you'll see some unsmoothed curves that indicate why we, we want to smooth them. Um, this is a, a result of a model ranking approach that David Roop came up with and, and was published last year, uh, which he's also now applied, as I mentioned, to the southeastern uh, U.S. or the southeast CSC. Um, it's a fairly complicated approach, as explained in the paper. It includes a variety of metrics of spatiotemporal variability of temperature and precipitation. And we use this to guide our selection of models uh, tending to uh, recommend and use the ones on the left end of, of this figure. So I'm going to start on the climate model results with a slightly complicated figure. This is the only one of these I'm going to show, um, but I, I have reasons for showing it. What this figure shows is the change in temperature and precipitation, the y and x axes respectively, for this set of models currently available. The number is the model rank. So one is the best and 30-something um, is the lowest. Um, not all models are in, uh, included because, as I noted before, some models that had 20th century runs, which led to the ranking, did not have 21st century runs, and those are gradually being filled in. Um, but generally, the numbers in the 20s and 30s are models that it works on the 20th century. The um, plus symbol is the mean of all of the model simulations for that RCP. Um, the, the dark numbers have uh, MACA data available and the light uh, are um, not available. The gray shading uh, around both the X and Y axes are the percentiles of interannual variability uh, during the 20th century. So it helps us see that, for instance, looking just at the X axis variability, that most of the models um, say that the future uh, late, late 21st century precipitation, annual mean precipitation, will be within the range of variability experienced in the, fa in the past. Um, so if you look at those plus symbols, they're shifting by, by only 5% and 8%. Some of the models uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you see 11s and 29s, um, indicate large increases in precipitation. No models indicate large decreases in precipitation. I've circled um, the number 15 because for some of the results you're, you'll see, we're, we're going to focus on that model, the MIROC 5 model, um, because it's sort of in the middle of the pack um, and it's a reasonably good performer. 
So this is uh, uh, the first of several slides like this that I will show where the 20th century simulations are shown in gray with the all model average uh, shown as a heavy black line. And then going into the future where RCP 4.5 is shown in yellow with one um, heavy curve uh, ending at about six degrees Fahrenheit of warming and the other heavy curve uh, for RCP 8.5. So you notice the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 worlds start to diverge uh, somewhere around 2030 or 2040. And by the end of the century, they're, not only are they five degrees Fahrenheit difference in the multimodal average, but notice the slope as well. The RCP 4.5 um, world has climate starting to stabilize, and the RCP 8.5 world um, is continuing to change at a pretty rapid clip. Um, there's a, a, an overlap between these two that's indicated in orange, and you can see the, the range of variability um, is a, a couple of degrees um, Celsius uh, or, or several degrees Fahrenheit. So the coolest model down at the very bottom of the yellow area uh, would give a, a warming of only a couple degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century for the RCP 4.5 scenario, whereas the hottest model with RCP 8.5 uh, would have us warming uh, by about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, many of the results that I'll show later are either just for MIRAC 5 or, the, or for the all-model average. This is the same kind of plot for precipitation. And uh, you'll notice that um, there was very little change during the 20th century, and even during the 21st century, um, only a few percent change for the all-model average. Now, you remember from the, the complicated scatter diagram, there were a few models that indicated, indicated large increases in precipitation, but the robust message is um, that there, there doesn't appear to be a solid indication that precipitation would, would change dramatically in the annual mean. We'll come to the seasonal differences uh, shortly. Um, the MACA data, which are, are um, uh, summarized here for the Pacific Northwest region, includes other variables like wind speed. And uh, so this is a plot of change in the average uh, wind speed over the Northwest. Um, so a decrease of roughly 5% for the all model average um, for RCP 4.5, slightly more for RCP 8.5. Um, and this appears to be uh, because several models uh, tend to have the Pacific storm track shifting uh, farther north, uh, so we get fewer uh, windy winter storms. Uh, the diurnal temperature range is important for many ecological applications. And here we start to see some interesting um, seasonal variations. The so, uh, winter diurnal temperature range decreases, and the summer diurnal temperature range increases. Uh, notice the y-axis are somewhat different here. Um, the decreases and increases are um, fairly comparable in magnitude, uh, roughly one degree Celsius. Um, and this is mostly um, having to do with changes in cloudiness, as indicated um, by this figure. Now, we don't yet have full results for RCP 4.5, so all that's shown here is RCP 8.5. But the winter um, shortwave radiation goes down, indicating a reduction in um, uh, I'm sorry, an increase in cloudiness, which is also connected with the decrease in diurnal temperature range. And then in summer, the reverse is true, and uh, a decrease in cloudiness in, leads to uh, an increase in incoming shortwave radiation and an increase in diurnal temperature range. Um, the maximum temperature in June, July, August is shown here, along with the MIROC 5 results. Uh, and again, all results have been smoothed. Um, so that you're not seeing um, thousands of individual uh, symbols indicating each model, uh, each model's uh, uh, annual output. But the, um, the results here um, uh, broadly uh, align with what's been observed, an increase in um, summer daily maximum temperature of a couple of degrees. Um, and then uh, going out into the future, um, pretty substantial increases uh, in, in summer temperature, especially in the um, RCP 8.5 scenario, um, much more modest in the RCP 4.5. Um, seasonal precipitation, um, in general, uh, the, the seasons include models that say it will get wetter and models that say it will get drier. And so these broad shaded areas you'll see uh, for winter, almost all of them go up. 
um, but some of them don't go up much. And in individual uh, models, uh, there, there are some that, that actually go down for winter. Likewise, for summer, um, the, the average precipitation of average across all the models goes down somewhat. Uh, for some, it goes down dramatically, and for some, it actually goes up. So a lot more ambiguity about changes in precipitation, even on the seasonal time scale, than about changes in temperature. Um, all of these data are available from the MACA website, and I'll rep repeat this URL on the last slide so you don't need to scramble to write it down. Um, this is a screenshot of the MACA um, website, and if you do intend to use this, um, I strongly suggest that under analysis tools, you read the um, FAQ and, and guidelines on applying scenarios um, uh, so that you can avoid common pitfalls. On the right, you see the variables, many of which I just showed you. Um, you can do time slices, um, so 2040 to 69 or 2070 to 99. Um, you can also do some time series and other things. I've just selected the maps option here to give you a sense for um, some of the possibilities. Uh, the reason that we do the, the, the MACA downscaling is that the raw model output looks something like this. This is the change in temperature at roughly the, the spatial resolution of a typical um, global climate model. And uh, you can see that the pixels are um, you know, roughly one to two degrees uh, longitude by latitude. Um, this figure shows the same map, but from the MACA downscaling. And um, so you see much finer features. Uh, the way MACA works is essentially to use large scale global model outputs in connection with fine scale observations to do a statistical connection between the two. Um, it, it still can't see mountains, so as I'll show shortly, we're also using regional modeling. Um, but this gives you a sense of, of what MACA is about. Uh, this is the same kind of map, but for winter diurnal temperature range, and so you can see those reductions that we were seeing earlier are, are not ubiquitous in the northwest region, but they're really concentrated over the Rocky Mountains. Um, this is a, a, a sample of the results from some regional modeling. This is from a, what we call a super ensemble, where we uh, use volunteers' personal computers to complete um, tens of thousands of one-year simulations. Uh, we've got both uh, 1960 to 2009. Um, we actually have 130,000 simulations over that uh, uh, period. And then uh, 2029 20, to 2049. Uh, and this shows the uh, difference in temperature in spring uh, from these modeling results. And, and if you know anything about the geography of the western U.S., you'll recognize that the mountain ranges uh, tend to warm more than, than the lower elevation areas around them. So you see the Cascades in Washington and Oregon um, warming more than the areas to the east and west of them. Uh, and then down into California, the Sierras and, and the Siena, Siskiyou, and Trinity Mountains warming more than their surrounding areas, and then the same thing over in Utah with, with the Wasatch Mountains and, um, to some extent, the Rockies in Idaho. Uh, we've done a little bit of analysis, and this seems to be linked both to changes in um, solar radiation, i.e. cloudiness, and also um, snowpack. Uh, these are interesting and important results, but we have not fed them into the vegetation and hydrologic modeling. So the results I'm about to show are, are just from the MACA data. So a summary for the climate, um, all of the scenarios show warming in every season. Um, however, there's a very wide range, so we can't say with confidence um, what the amount of warming will be, only that, that it will warm. Um, and our, our, some forthcoming publications include tables with estimates of the uh, 25th and 75th percentiles uh, and a lot of other statistics. The emission scenario starts to matter a lot after about 2030 in the total amount of warming that you get in any given uh, uh, period. The models with the least warming in the 21st century, I forgot to point this out on the scatter diagram. Uh, down in the bottom of the scatter diagram, the models with the least amount of warming tended to have numbers in the upper 20s and 30s, so they, meaning that they didn't do very well at 20th century climate. Um, so this suggests that a quality weighting of the models um, leads to a slight increase in the estimate of a lower bound of warming. Um, seasonal differences, summer uh, 
appears to be somewhat warmer and drier and sunnier than other seasons. Uh, trends in that direction, not just um, the, the baseline, and winter somewhat wetter and cloudier. So in other words, an accentuation of the existing seasonal cycle um, with, with enhanced warming in summer, um, uh, less precipitation in summer and more in winter. And then the regional modeling um, uh, strongly suggests the mountains, especially in spring, will warm more. Now, for the hydrology modeling, we, we used a, a couple of different approaches. Um, we started with a sensitivity approach, which is to compute the response in flow at 200-plus um, points in the northwest to small changes in temperature and precipitation using one of these hydrologic models. This follows on some work that Julie Vano did, which was um, just the coverage article in the most recent edition of the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. She initially did this work, and that's what was just published in the Colorado River Basin, and she's now done it for um, the Northwest. So this is a useful way to explore uncertainty, and I'll show an example of this um, next. The second approach we used is to do full distributed um, hydrologic modeling using the, the variable infiltration capacity VIC model developed at University of Washington over 20 years ago and uh, continuously updated since then. It's really the workhorse for uh, climate impact studies uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, Dennis Lutmeyer, the head of the hydrology group at UW, um, has recently developed a unified land model, which is a, a merger of, of uh, two other models. Those simulations have not yet been completed, um, but they're, they're, uh, they're on the way. And again, the objective is to use um, available tools to characterize and quantify the range of possibilities or the, the uncertainty. So this is just a, a, a brief um, uh, uh, additional detail. The unified land model is the merger of the NOAA and Sacramento hydrologic models. Um, on the right uh, are the equations that, that describe this sensitivity approach. Uh, the elasticity of precipitation is the flow response, where Q stands for flow, to a 1% increase in precipitation. And the temperature sensitivity is the flow response to a tenth degree increase in temperature. And we've done that on the monthly time scale, seasonal, and annual time scale just to, to um, uh, fully understand what's going on. So this is an example of the sensitivity approach applied to the Willamette River Basin. Uh, so the VIC model was run um, w with the baseline historical climate and then uh, increasing the temperature um, and, and separately increasing precipitation. And we've done this for temperature increases um, one, two, three, and four degrees Celsius, which is why um, the curves uh, here are nonlinear. I'll explain the curves in a minute. So here's the same kind of scatter plot that you saw earlier with the list of models um, uh, indicated as numbers and the uh, precipitation change on the x-axis and the temperature change on the y-axis. We're now picking the precipitation season, um, January through June, that makes the most difference for June, July, August uh, stream flow. And likewise, the temperature change October through June, um, which makes the most, the most um, difference. So the curving lines are the outputs of the sensitivity approach, and they indicate um, isoclusts of constant um, or, or uh, the same amount of change in the summer flow. So if you start down at the bottom at 0, 0, um, there is a 0% curve, which uh, tracks up and to the right, so you'll see that a one degree Celsius increase in temperature can be offset roughly by a 10 percent increase in precipitation in that season. As the warming um, gets more and more, it actually takes less and less precipitation increase to offset the temperature increase. So the curves end up at the top of the diagram going almost vertical. Now you can see there's only uh, two models that suggest an increase in summer flow, uh, model number 15 and model number 21. The big plus symbols indicating the averages for RCP 4.5 and 8.5 are uh, in the sort of 20 to 25 percent decrease range, if you see the, the contour labels down at the lower uh, left part of the diagram. 
And the most extreme uh, scenarios are those from model number seven, the, the HADGEM2 model. It's a, a quite a, a solid performer in the Northwest. And um, that leads to decreases, according to our linear estimates here, of uh, over 50% in the summer flow. So this is a quick way to get a sense for what the probability distribution is of changes in flow, given, in this case, over 100 um, uh, scenarios from different climate models. Uh, now for some early results from the VIX modeling, again, for the MIROC-5. Um, this is for the Columbia Basin at the Dalles, so, so it's the cold part of the Northwest. Uh, 1950 to 2005 shown as solid curves, and 2006 to 2100 shown as bash curves. So even with some increases in precipitation in this MIROC simulation, the um, uh, shift in the flow is quite pronounced. So starting in March, future flows are quite a bit more than uh, past flows. And uh, starting in June, the future flows are quite a bit lower than past flows, which, um, as we've seen in earlier studies, is indicative of a reduced role of, of snowmelt. And we'll show the snowmass shortly. Um, August soil moisture, this is a, what's called an a, a exceedance probability curve. Um, if you haven't seen these before, uh, it may be a little bit confusing. But at the left edge are the largest amounts, that is, the amounts that are uh, essentially never exceeded, so they have an exceedance probability of zero. And on the right are the lowest amounts, so they have a, a, an exceedance probability of 100%. So the future, uh, uh, the future distribution uh, across the board shifts by about 10 or 15%. So the uh, lowest uh, soil moistures in the future um, drop from uh, 255 or so uh, millimeters uh, so up to uh, 230. Um, now I'm going to step quickly through the uh, MIROC results for, for snow. So this is a historical simulation. Um, notice the uh, uh, very bright white amounts, uh, very high amounts on the uh, east slopes of the Cascade Mountains at the left edge of the map and uh, also in the, the Rocky Mountains on the, the right edge of, of the colored part of the diagram. So this is the same thing now on the left, but for 2021 to 2040. And the right panel shows the percentage change. So at lower elevations, um, the percent change is, is quite dramatic, uh, 60 to 100%. You can even see that's happening in the river valleys as well, up in uh, British Columbia, for example. Um, notice that there are some places, the higher elevations, that actually see increases in, in, um, in April uh, snow water equivalent. So I'm now going to step forward to 2040s, and you see more blue left white on the left diagram and more red on the white diagram, 2060 to 2080, and then 2081 to 2100. So just to summarize the hydrology, uh, note these are preliminary results. The sensitivity approach is a promising way to get a large number of simulations uh, and, and estimate what the effects would be of a wide range of climates. And what we find is that for the current generation of models, the uh, Willamette flow would decrease by about 25% uh, with a, a range from uh, zero to a little over 50%. Uh, snow greatly decreases over the 21st century, as we just saw in the MIROC-5 maps. And late summer soil moisture also decreases. And uh, lots more simulations to follow. These are just preliminary results. Now, for vegetation, um, a, a quick word about the two vegetation models we're using. These, these, these are constructed differently. They, they have um, different approaches entirely, whereas our two hydrologic models are both distributed models that, that use water and energy balance. Um, these use quite different uh, approaches. So the MC2 is a dynamic general vegetation model. Um, the intent is to simulate the uh, biogeography, that is essentially what grows where, keying into um, key seasons. Uh, for climate variables. Um, it also simulates biogeochemistry and wildfire interactions. Plant types in the model are distinguished by whether they're evergreen or deciduous and by leaf shape. Um, the main climate drivers are the temperature in the coldest month and the precipitation during the growing season. Um, those determine the dominance of uh, the, the life forms, grass, shrub, and tree. Uh, the simulation domain that we're using here is Western US. The 3PG model is a forest physiology model. Um, it has a light use efficiency based uh, uh, photosynthesis algorithm. Um, it 
simulates net primary production, which MC2 does as well, but with a somewhat different approach. Uh, it also simulates wood production and forest succession. Um, model outputs like the soil, water, and the vapor pressure deficit um, predict species presence and absence. Um, Nicholas Koops, who is the um, primary author on, on the 3PG model, published a study in 2011 showing that this presence, species presence absence accuracy was 82% for the 20th century climate. And the domain here is Western U.S. as well. Um, for some purposes, the results will be um, aggregated by ecoregion, as shown here. Um, for uh, these purposes, for simplicity, I'm just going to show Northwest average results and also Willamette Valley, which is uh, ecoregion number three over near the left edge of the diagram. So this is uh, for, for the northwestern part of the domain, uh, north of 42 degrees and west of 111 degrees longitude. And um, this is sort of uh, curious. Um, it, you can see at the bottom the, the model uh, simulations have went into the, um, into the MC2 model shown here. So the RCP 8.5 scenario has the um, vegetation carbon uh, initially decreasing to about mid-century and then starting to increase again. And uh, essentially what happens is um, the uh, wildfires over the first half of the century, which are indicated here, um, gradually increase. And so there's a, a reduction in certain types of, of trees and then a transformation to other types of trees. And as the wildfires decrease toward the end of the century, the, the uh, vegetation carbon increases again. Um, this is uh, more dramatic. We look just at the uh, Willamette Valley. This is now ecosystem carbon, uh, which is a little different from vegetation carbon. Um, and the initial uh, carbon storage drops by about 20% from the beginning of the runs to about 2070 and then starts to increase again. And, and again, this has a lot to do with wildfire. It's more dramatic uh, here. Um, the spikes are uh, unfiltered time series for individual models. And uh, you can see each of the models at some point has a big fire in the first half of the century. And then things sort of quiet down. Uh, what's, what can burn has burned. And uh, we're, we're left with a new, a new um, configuration of vegetation. Uh, so this is a, a fairly dramatic example of, of this kind of transformation. Uh, these results are available from a website. The URL will follow shortly. Um, but again, there's some mapping tools uh, where you can select an ecoregion, select some uh, uh, variables. Uh, you can output uh, both the, the climate data, which are the inputs, and then also um, these diagrams on the, the lower right, which indicate the fraction of the domain that's in forest, shrub, grass, or desert. Uh, and these, in some cases, show pretty interesting and dramatic um, transformations from one kind of vegetation to another. Uh, this is just an example. This is for, uh, this is actually not for the Northwest, but it shows um, the kinds of, of plots that we'll be making available shortly uh, for a particular model, the CAN ESM2. Um, uh, over this domain, uh, the forest increases at the expense of um, grassland and especially desert. Um, so this is uh, uh, just one preliminary slide of results from the 3PG model. The upper left is, again, our favorite MIROC uh, model, um, the net primary productivity in the 1990s. On the right, the same thing for the 2090s. And at first glance, they look quite similar. Um, but if you look, for example, in the Willamette Valley or the northern um, Sacramento Valley of California, um, you see um, some pretty big reductions. And the bottom left panel shows the, the reduction uh, amounts. And um, so you see that for, for the inland west, um, uh, the brown color, which indicates small reductions between zero and negative three of these units, which I've forgotten what MGDM stands for. Um, those, those, that, that color is pretty prevalent in the Western US. And the, the lighter brown color is uh, prevalent in the um, coastal parts of Washington, Oregon, and California. So, so larger decreases in NPP. And again, this, this model also indicates um, uh, changes in NPP um, 
uh, possibly related to, to fire and, and other things. So uh, again, some preliminary results, but summary for the vegetation, west-wide increases in stored carbon and net primary productivity um, uh, for, for RCP 8.5. Um, the burned area increases initially and then decreases, especially in the Willamette Valley. Uh, fairly large transition in vegetation, which uh, we're still working on for the Willamette Valley. Um, and some shift in vegetation to uh, shrub and forest across the west. Um, and the MC2 results are at climate uh, at this website, which again I'll, I'll repeat this URL at the at the very end of the talk. So a summary of the whole talk: um, climate models indicate uh, robustly that that the region will warm in the 21st century as it has in the 20th century, but but uh, more dramatically. We're we're still catching up to the carbon that was emitted over the last few decades. So there's, there's a, a time lag between emission of carbon and warming, and so we're locked into some additional warming. Um, but also, the emissions are increasing rapidly. Uh, precipitation changes are uncertain. Um, there's a general tendency for winters to be wetter and summers to be drier. Um, there are a profound shifts in, in some basins in snowmelt driven hydrology, with um, summer flows decreasing, even in fairly rain dominant basins like the Willamette. Uh, in some places, there will be um, wholesale changes in vegetation type and, and in fire risk. Uh, and that seems to be more of an issue uh, west of the Cascade and Sierra and Nevada mountains than, than east. So that is uh, the extent of my talk. And uh, for more information, um, as I mentioned, there's an, uh, a full day uh, version of this in two weeks. It will uh, also be webcast, and um, you can sign up for the webcast or for the workshop at our website, ACRI.net. You can get the climate data from uh, this URL or the vegetation data from that URL. And now I'd be happy to open it up to questions. Hi, David. Thanks for tuning in. Always enjoy um, interacting with you. And um, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the, the question is, why would anyone choose MACA over, say, BCSD, monthly ARRM, or other products? Um, have we done an inner comparison shows advantages and disadvantages, or a comparison to regional climate modeling outputs? Um, yeah, so so there are, as you note, a wide range of downscaling products available. Um, previously, BCSD, which was sort of the workhorse, uh, was primarily monthly, and the reason for that is that it relied on the um, outputs of the climate models. And the CMET3 models only um, uh, made available monthly outputs with a few exceptions. This time around with CMET5, we do actually have daily outputs, and BCSD has been repeated with all the CMET5, um, or a great many of the CMET5 uh, model simulations, and that's available as well. Um, part of the reason that we were interested in using MACA was that it has a lot more variables available, uh, as I noted. Um, not just max and min temperature and precipitation, which are available through BCSD, but also wind speed, solar radiation, relative humidity, which, uh, as it turns out, are the variables that a large number of um, impact models want to use. So John initially developed MACA for input to fire modeling, but it's also useful for the MC2 vegetation modeling and for um, the hydrologic modeling. In fact, we had a separate project to um, uh, see how um, including uh, the, full, the full suite of MACA inputs changed um, the simulation of, of stream flow with VIC. And, and we do see some improvements, uh, particularly in, in drier climates with the treatment of solar radiation. Um, it, it's, it's not uh, a panacea. There, there may be a better approach that comes down the road. And um, we would love to use regional modeling outputs. The problem is that um, Aside from the NARCAP, um, there are not, uh, which, which is a, a whole separate conversation that I don't want to get into here, uh, it's difficult to find a good range of uh, regional models except with our um, super ensemble, and, and we're pretty excited about that. We're going to do some new runs that include full daily outputs so that we can start using those for inputs, um, and we can play around with model parameters to um, get a, a bigger spread in um, temperature and precipitation projections. 
um, you, know, you asked if we compared uh, MACA with regional modeling outputs. Um, if you think back to the slide I showed of the temperature change from the regional model, um, no statistical downscaling approach is going to be able to mimic that kind of terrain-induced um, change in climate where there's something going on in the regional, regional model. It's an interplay between clouds and um, snow and in the mountains that leads to more warming. Um, statistical approaches uh, can only key off what the, mo the global model knows. And if the global model doesn't know there's a mountain range there, it's not going to be able to have that kind of um, cloud and snow interaction. Thank you. We have another question from Laura. It says, how reliable are, are the fire predictions from the vegetation models? Well, we won't know until we get there, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the uh, the, the fire modules in, the, in um, MC2 um, have been tested uh, to some extent against observations. Um, the, the, the problem is you, you, you never know when a fire w would actually occur or how big it will be given um, uh, fire conditions. So it, in some ways, um, it's pretty difficult to uh, compare the past uh, simulation of fire with with observations. Uh, that said, we know that warm and drier summers, especially in the Northwest, lead to a greatly increased um, average uh, area burned, and mechanisms like that are, are in the fire module. Um, but, but yeah, we won't we won't know uh, how well those perform uh, with with future climates because uh, we're we're going to until we get there because uh, uh, the the uh, uh, Hot, dry, the heat and dryness of future summers will um, very likely exceed um, anything we've experienced, and, and uh, we, w we won't know exactly how these systems will react. Another thing to note about these uh, vegetation modeling efforts: um, the the system, as simulated, is a bit more responsive to climate changes than the actual system. And what I mean by that is. Although there's a bit of history built in, um, part of what's being simulated is, is sort of the potential vegetation. So particularly when we talk about vegetation distribution, which I, I left those results out, but they influence the net primary productivity uh, and the fire. Um, when the vegetation changes in the model, it, it, it changes more rapidly than in observations, unless there's just been a fire and then something new can grow in. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from James Rourke. It says, this is outside the scope of the current talk, but is there any plans to address climate change effects on coastal eco ecosystems? Um, true, that's outside the scope of this talk. Um, we're really just trying to describe the uh, broad scale changes. Um, there are coastal ecoregions in the vegetation models, and, and they uh, unsurprisingly change uh, uh, less um, because the ocean uh, moderates the climate change uh, somewhat, uh, le less than, say, uh, the Willamette Valley or, and other uh, inland locations. Um, but as, as for more broad scale uh, types of impacts, that's, that's, um, we, we leave that to others to work, work out. All right, Amy Daniels asks that you go back to the model ranking graph, and if you could explain that in a little bit more detail. And she wants to confirm that it was for um, native resolution GCM simulations. Okay. Um, I, you should be able to see the figure now. Um, yes. These were, um, I believe um, David first interpolated these to a common grid for comparing with observations. Um, and, and so the observations were coarsened in a, in a similar way so that we, we could have a fair comparison. Um, 
I don't remember the second part of Amy's question. Um, the second part is, sorry, pulling it right back up. Um, it says, was was that for native resolution GCM simulations? Yes. Okay, so just one question. Yes. Okay. And Amy, does that answer your question? Um, was that enough detail for you? And then just while she's getting back to it, uh, we'll take another question. Um, it's from Caveata. It says the two vegetation models are still a relatively coarse ecoregional scale to be of great use to natural resource managers at small scales. Are there any effects, or excuse me, efforts to develop finer vegetative models for the Northwest? Um, yeah, I, 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 thank you, Kavita. I um, was, I was not clear in describing um, the details of these models. So the, the MACA output are um, at quite fine scale, and both the hydrology and the vege vegetation models were also run at quite fine scale. Um, I believe four kilometers, uh, four to six kilometers in both cases. So um, that um, that level of detail is available. Um, I, I just didn't highlight the uh, the fineness of the resolution in in the results that I presented. But um, if if I uh, I'm just going to steal back the the um, camera here and put the um, hydrologic model up. So so this is uh, roughly the same uh, spatial resolution uh, in the hydrologic model that's also used in the vegetation model. So you can see some pretty fine details there. Um, for instance, in the Washington Cascades, you can see a, uh, the low snow area in the Yakima Valley, which sort of slices um, east to west, uh, roughly at the latitude of Puget Sound. Uh, and up in the Canadian part of the basin, you can see actually the Columbia River Valley um, uh, par roughly paralleling the continental divide uh, as, as a very low snow area, and then uh, up toward the north end of it, you can see it's you know one pixel wide, and the mountains around it are quite quite a bit higher and snowier. Same kind of thing for um, the vegetation. Um, um, so here's. Here's the native resolution of the vegetation model, uh, the 3PG model. And um, again, you can see that uh, the actual details are at a few kilometers resolution. Oh, okay. We had another question that came in by text, too. Yeah, um, Amy, Amy just asked, uh, what went into the principal components analysis, if she's understanding that correctly? Yeah, um, uh, OK, so fair, fair question. Um, the um, the point of the principal components analysis was uh, basically to cluster um, types of metrics uh, that were similar. So, um, for instance, if you if you think about various temperature metrics, the the spatial the the, the area average temperature, um, if a model is too warm in the annual mean, um, is it also too warm in the winter and the summer? Uh, those might be related. Is the winter minus summer uh, or summer minus winter difference, say in temperature or precipitation um, related. So there were there were about 20 different metrics that went into this, and the point of the principal components analysis was to um, reduce them to uh, meaningfully different ones um, that, that ended up some covering um, spatial values and others uh, temporal variability. Um, for details, see the paper. I, I, uh, it would it would take a while to explain the next level of complexity, but that's that's the upshot. Okay, we have one from Robert. Uh, it says, can you explain further the projected winter time trends of the modest precipitation increase, more cloudiness, and less wind speed? Less wind speed because the storm track is farther north, and then more precipitation because warmer air can hold more moisture. What about the cloudiness? 
Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't dug into those results in that level of detail, and um, I, I, yeah, the the shifts in the storm track are, are probably modest. Um, the average in, in across all models, this isn't our work, but it was in the um, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it was to, it's only a couple of degrees latitude shift by the end of the century. Uh, so the storms do carry more moisture, and uh, you're quite right about that. So we may get somewhat fewer of them. Um, as to why we get um, fewer storms but more clouds, that's, uh, again, something that we haven't looked into. Thank you. Good um, question, though. And then we'll have to bring up the link again for the, uh, the integrated scenarios calculator. People would like to write those down. Okay. Um, question from Paul it says, how detailed is the vegetation information? For example, does it define tree species that are changing? Um, no, um, not quite. There, there are vegetation classes, and MC2 and 3PG handle um, handle them differently. Um, and, and so there are a, a, a variety of tree species uh, collected into one, um, uh, one type, um, but you can, you can, you know, I, I showed the example of the wholesale shifts from uh, uh, one type of vegetation to another. Uh, those are large vegetation classes. There are also um, much smaller uh, groupings that, that are the native outputs of the models. Um, but you, you can learn more on the, on the website here, conservation biology. And then it says, again from Paul, it says, when you say that there is uncertainty in the precipitation trend, what level is the uncertainty, especially in regards to the winter precipitation? Um, yeah, great question. Um, so here is that same kind of scatter diagram that I showed before, um, and this is the uh, diagram for winter, and on the right you can see the tables that summarize the um, range and the uh, 25th and 75th percentile. So uh, the, the, the table there in the middle that, that says change in precipitation, for the RCP 8.5, there's um, there's one model that has a 29% increase. Um, now, it, I would note that um, if you look on the diagram and you look closely, you would say, wait a minute, I see an 11 that's up at 35%. Um, the reason that 35% isn't shown is that there are a number of 11s, and those are all different simulations from the same model, and those have been averaged together before inclusion in the table on the right. So all of model number 11 averaged together um, gives about a 29% increase in winter precipitation. The 75th percentile is 11.5. Uh, um, the uh, okay, we're going to have to get to the bottom of this. I'm not understanding why the um, mean of the 25th percentile go up, but the minimum is 7.5% uh, decrease. Okay. We have just a couple more questions um, as we're running out of time. Uh, Steve Klein, you can ask your question now. Please remember to press star six. Uh, yeah, Phil, my question is in regard to the uh, vegetation models and whether in fact um, it's possible to uh, leverage this modeling work um, and use the um, drivers of moisture and temperature to uh, look at the effect at, at plant associations. In other words, is there a level of refinement that can build upon uh, what's been done in these two models? Yeah, I'll have to talk with the vegetation modeling folks and get back to you on that, Steve. It's a good question. Okay. And then one comment, if the uh, host could uh, send those links out uh, to the data sources and where this would be posted, that would the, the webinar would be posted, that would be helpful to the participants. Yes, uh, 
Holly will be sending that information out. It takes about one to two weeks to edit um, the recorded version of the webinar and get it closed captioned, and she will send that all out. Uh, currently, the link is there on, in the chat box uh, when we go back to that screen, and that's going to be where this webinar, as well as all the previous webinars, are um, held. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, a uh, question from Nancy Green. She says, excellent webinar. You mentioned some applications are available for the Southwest and Southeast. How can we get that information? Um, so the, um, the MACA data are available for the whole continental U.S. Um, from the website shown here. Um, the hydrology and vegetation modeling is available west of, I think, 105 degrees longitude, I have to check. Um, and so, so those have not been done for the southeastern U.S. Uh, what, what I specifically mentioned had been done for the southeast is the, the same kind of model evaluation approach um, that, uh, that we published in JGR last fall. And those were done for the southeast CFC in a project that's taking place this spring, and we haven't yet um, handed off the results. Uh, we, we, we're, we're still in process with that, but um, you can check back with us or with the Southeast CFC in a month or two. But that's, again, only the model evaluation part for the climate models. Thank you. And our last question will be from Paul. And it says, the trend from the desert to the forest is surprising. A trend from the Douglas fir to the pine or the pine to the scrub would be more expected. What is driving those predictions? Um, I'm not even sure the domain that that covered that was for a different project. Um, the, the graphics um, are for the Northwest are still being developed, um, and so we're, we're not prepared to show those yet, and without knowing what domain that covered, I can't comment intelligently. I included that just as an example of uh, what's about to be available. But presumably increases in precipitation, which are, um, uh, which show up in some areas, um, could, could drive that kind of change. Excellent. Thank you. And I do not see any more questions. And then Holly or Sean, did you have any closing remarks? Uh, no closing remarks, I guess, other than um, we will be, in addition to posting the material on the web, if people would like uh, some additional materials related to data sources and information, we'll be making those available uh, as well. That'll be on our website. There was one other question, Ashley, that came in on the chat box from John Butcher. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, good question, John. Um, he asked, does hydrologic modeling include effects of increased atmospheric CO2 on plant to model conductance and ET? Um, no, it does not. The hydrologic modeling uh, with Vic uh, that we've done assumes static vegetation. So that that is an area where a coupled model would uh, do better in that the hydrologic part and the vegetation part would talk to each other more than they have in these modeling frameworks. Um, and that, that's an ambition for you know, somewhere down the road that we could uh, have a better, better coupling between those two types of models. But at this point, they're um, it's static vegetation. Uh, there, there have been experiments with the VIC model using changing vegetation, but uh, we haven't attempted to do that here. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, for everybody that has been asking, um, that website, again, is posted in the chat box. If you have any pro problems getting that down, um, please let me know. Oh, we had one more pop in from Dan Isaac, and it says, there's some recent research. Oh, it's not a... Uh, there's some recent research published in Science, Missing Mountain Water. Its paper suggesting total precipitation is decreasing. Do new 
runs address this? Yeah, so the paper that um, Dan is referring to was published. Uh, Charlie Luce was the lead author. John Abatoglu, who's on, our, on this project, was a co-author. And um, the, the point that they made is that if you look over the past, uh, I forget what period of record in that paper was, 50 years or so, um, it looks as if uh, weakening westerly winds across the um, Cascade Mountains have led to a, a, a reduced rain shadow effect. And, um, and so, and the orographic enhancement as the, as the wind is forced up and over the mountain range uh, has gotten weaker. Um, that kind of effect would not show up explicitly in in the MACA results, but it, it would show up in the regional modeling, and it's it's not something we've seen very robustly in the regional model. Um, the the decreases in wind speed that I noted uh, out of the GCMs are important, um, but uh, it's hard hard to gauge how much effect um, the how well that effect would would play out in the in the future. Uh, it, it would it would tend to shift um, the distribution of precipitation a little bit from the west to the east. Ironically, um, a strong rain shadow effect squeezes out more of the moisture before it crosses the mountains, and therefore a weaker rain shadow effect leaves more of the moisture in to be dumped on the other side of the mountains. Thank you.